Today, I'm joined by Dr. Tanvi Kim. She is a neuroscientist with expertise in field neuroscience, which I'd never heard of. It seems like you're a pioneer in this field. So I'm excited to talk about that. Uh, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, so could you please define field neuroscience? Yeah, so, um, okay, field neuroscience, as it is defined in my PhD thesis, is um, the study of nervous systems in increasingly natural contexts. So the way that I describe it when I do like science communication events is neuroscience out of the lab and into the wild. Um, yeah, and it mostly started because, so when I was an undergrad, I really, really enjoyed, um, you know, my undergraduate degree in brain and cognitive science. And especially there was this one lab class where uh, we got to do, basically it was just like a tour de force of all of the techniques and, you know, the, the different kinds of imaging and also dissection um, techniques and surgical tools and all this stuff. And I was like, I'm really good at this. I have pretty good fine motor control, but wow, this feels very disturbing to me to be like cutting into like living tissue and sort of over time, like I was thinking about it more and more. And by the time I got to, you know, when I was entering grad school, I had decided that I would really, really love to figure out a way to do neuroscience non-invasively, completely non-invasively. Um, and sort of over the years, and I just graduated, so, you know, it's all kind of fresh. Um, I've developed a more sort of nuanced justification that sort of fits into what I see um, are, the, are the gaps in the field of neuroscience, mainly that, like, yes, we, we study neuroscience because we're fascinated by the many different nervous systems that exist, but also sort of in the end, if we're completely honest about it, we're studying neuroscience because we want to understand how human brains work. And there's, um, there's been sort of this big crisis recently where the translation between laboratory experiments and laboratory results and trying to move that into a clinical context and trying to apply what we know from the lab to humans, that step has been consistently failing. And so uh, to, my, to my perspective, in my mind, the sort of missing link here is that We've gotten so like we've we've dove deep into the, the the rabbit hole of invasive techniques, which are really cool, very sexy. You know, they they give us amazing you know data and huge amounts of data, which always feels very productive. Um, but it 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 has meant that we've neglected the more ethological aspect of studying behavior and studying brains. And um, whenever, whenever I give sort of more formal presentations about neuroscience and field neuroscience and what is the sort of like where it fits in historically, I like to refer to the first uh, annual review of neuroscience, which was published in the late 1960s. And the editors they claimed right at the beginning of it all, at the birth of modern neuroscience, they said that nothing is more important than understanding the relationship between behavior and nervous systems. I think they actually phrase it as how the nervous system controls behavior. And so it's like, okay, cool. We've, we have cataloged to a very detailed degree, you know, all the components of the nervous system. We have so many tools and techniques for the molecular aspects, cellular aspects, but then making that connection to behavior, we are still struggling with that, you know, 60 years later. And so, um, yeah, I see field neuroscience as sort of really deliberately reclaiming that connection between, you know, the the cellular molecular side of things, but then also what, what are the things we can learn about nervous systems by carefully observing the movements of bodies? And so that that's the long-winded <laughs> answer to your question. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. So it sounds like there's this sort of layered approach, like with, with neuroscience, if it's invasive, you you're either like doing I don't know, neurosurgery experiments on like rats or things, or, or looking at humans who already have brain damage. And then maybe a tier above that, non-invasive imaging, but then that's confined to a lab. So then the tier above that is like non-invasive techniques outside of a lab. 
Exactly, exactly. Because we we've gotten very aware of how sensitive, you know, brains and nervous systems are to context, to priming, to, you know, what just happened five minutes ago, you know, and so and, and also like, in what environment did you develop in and what sort of childhood did you have? All these things are, are definitely huge influences. And so then if you apply that thinking to, you know, what kinds of brains are we studying in a laboratory setting? Well, these are animals that have lived in a sterile basement. They've never seen the sun. They've never seen the sky. They get their food delivered to them every single day. And, you know, I don't really know that many humans who live that kind of life. <laughs> At least outside of COVID. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, the pandemic has really dramatically shifted all of this. But I mean, I want to I, I want to understand, you know, what is the kind of brain, what is the kind of nervous system that, al you know, allows us to explore the world, to to dream about faraway planets, to, you know, like all of that stuff that that is not in a sterile laboratory environment. So that's the kind of nervous system that I wanna learn more about. Yeah, so you, so you mentioned that a lot of neuroscientists, maybe even most are, are looking to explain human behavior, but it seems like a lot of your work focused on cuttlefish. So <laughs> how did that happen? Well, okay, so uh, as, as I mentioned, like undergrad was really difficult for me. Um, I mean, MIT really busts your balls in, in many ways. And, and that's probably why I ended up doing so much musical theater. Uh, but so I was like, I graduated my undergraduate degree and I was like, I am never going back to school ever again. I'm going to get as far away from it as possible. Um, I did manage to do that to some degree, but I, I ended up working at the Boston Museum of Science. And um, the, the sort of role I was in was as a presenter for the current science and technology department. And basically what we did was we would find a news story about science or technology, we would develop a presentation about it, and then we would deliver this presentation on the museum floor. And then every three weeks we would cycle and change to a new story. So it was really exciting, very fast paced, and I was getting to, you know, explore a very wide breadth of topics, which was, which was great. Um, but then we, we chose a, like, biomimicry, like, story about um, how the U.S. Department of Defense is taking research in cuttlefish and cephalopods, which they use active camouflage. And so their nervous systems control structures in their skin that can change their color, their texture. And, and so, you know, of course, the military wants to use this to make better camouflage for their soldiers. And, and I was like, holy moly there are creatures who can actively morph like this is this is what I've been dreaming of ever since I got obsessed with animorphs as a as a small child and and so then I, I kept thinking like ah oh, this the three weeks is almost over I wish I could just study cuttlefish like for a couple more years and then like the the light bulb went off of like oh wait there is one job in the world where I can just study something because I want to for a really long time, and that's going to grad school. Um, so then, so then, yeah, and and actually, the uh, learning about cuttlefish made me realize I could actually make my argument for okay, I want to do neuroscience non-invasively, and here's how I'm going to do it. My chosen model system is going to be cuttlefish or cephalopods, and the argument is a little easier to make because anatomically speaking, like over 60% of their nervous system is controlling structures in their skin and changing their appearance. So then it's a lot easier to make the argument of, well, if I can figure out a way to very carefully observe their skin, then I'm actually, it's like, it's like a natural readout of their brain activity. Like I'm, I'm mm -hmm. studying a very, very close like proxy of nervous activity. So, so yeah, I mean, now, you know, now six years later, I feel like this is a fairly well accepted, you know, concept that, you know, cephalopods, you know, uh, that, that, that is cuttlefish, octopus, and squid, they are all sort of now being seen as like this emerging new model, like set of model species that uh, allow for this very interesting, you know, 
category of neuroscience experiments to be done non-invasively in a whole animal where you can study both single unit and whole organism behavior simultaneously. Like, I feel like now, like everyone's getting gotten really excited about it. So I'm, re I'm really glad that, you know, everyone's on this train because, yeah, they're, they're pretty sweet animals. One of yeah, my that's favorites. so cool. I've heard that they're very intelligent. So I'm wondering how much do we know if if when they camouflage and do all this cool stuff, if they're like thinking about it? Or is it more like a reflex response that their that their bodies just naturally do? So yeah, a, a lot of the research points towards this is a very deliberate thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so actually, um, I have the privilege of working with Roger Hanlon, who's kind of the like, the go to guy when it comes to cuttlefish research. So that was super cool. And he has like many, many decades of studying camouflage in cuttlefish. And it's definitely like, you know, they'll do these experiments where they'll put a different sort of, you know, um, like background underneath the animal and see how long it takes and then make a decision about was that a deliberate choice or not. Um, the specific thing that I studied was so when cuttlefish hunt, and this is something that had been observed many times in the wild, but people hadn't really been able to figure out how to study it. Um, so when cuttlefish hunt, right when they shoot their tentacles and as they're like pulling in their prey, they put on this like very conspicuous uh, body pattern that makes them very, very visible. And this is pretty unusual because it's like, okay, this creature, it survives by hiding. It survives by camouflage. And they're extremely good stealth hunters. Like, you know, most scuba divers will tell you if a cuttlefish does not want to be seen, you really have to work hard to find it. Um, but then when they're hunting, they suddenly put on this bright, flashy pattern. And it's like, okay, you are really distracted with your own food right now. Like, why are you making yourself more visible? And so um, the, the, the sort of result of the study that I conducted uh, was that, okay, we're pretty sure that this is a deliberate choice. What they're doing is that they are flashing this very sort of, you know, wildly conspicuous pattern to to startle any potential predator, to, to just make them pause for just a second and be like, wait a second, is that animal bigger or maybe more toxic than I thought it was? And even that one second gives a cuttlefish a moment to collect their wits and realize, okay, I'm about to be food as well. It's time to get out of here. Um, and so, yeah, like it, it very clearly, like I have these like really nice slow motion videos of them putting on this pattern. And then as soon as they failed, as soon as they realized, oh, I don't have any food to fight with, they will immediately go back to putting on a camouflage pattern. Um, and so, so yeah, then, and there's a whole, yeah, whole lot of other people, like mostly marine biologists who have done a lot of very meticulous studies looking at how deliberate is this. And you can you can actually get them to put on all sorts of like patterns and textures because they can also like bump out their skin. So they're um, in the same lab that I was working in when I was there, there was another student who was doing a series of studies where basically she had created all these like little spiky like sculptures with the spikes all in different sizes to see will they match and like how big and how small can they match and so like literally the experiment was put a little spiky structure inside of the the tank next to the cuttlefish and like record the video for a while watch it and then you can actually see it just be like oh look this one's a little smaller let me make really small spikes and then you put in like something with bigger spikes and it goes, oh wait, this one's bigger. I gotta, I gotta match that one. Let me put on bigger spikes. So they're, they're clearly, I mean, yes, it's a reaction, but also they're clearly like looking around and this is how they survive, right? So this is, this is like, all right, I gotta make sure that I'm putting on the best camouflage that I can. Yeah. Wow. There's, <laughs> there's so much there. I've heard of another species that does like this hypnosis thing. It'll rapidly change colors and try and stun its prey. Is that a cuttlefish? Yes, yes, yes. So um, that's uh, the uh, club something cuttlefish. So there's one that's really famous. It's an Australian species. And they're the ones that like, yeah, they really have this like strobing effect. But a lot of cuttlef many cuttlefish species can do that particular effect. It's called passing clouds. Um, and then also actually my favorite cuttlefish species is this tiny, tiny little species called the flamboyant cuttlefish. And it's constantly like 
putting on this passing clouds display and very bright colors. And it's like literally the size of like your thumb. Um, and it doesn't even swim. It like makes like little like pseudo legs. So it looks like a tiny psychedelic elephant walking around on the bottom of the ocean. And of course, everyone was like, all right, you're not hiding. You're very brightly colored. You must be toxic. And so that, yeah, they did some, some tests on, you know, the, the muscle tissue and whatnot. And yeah, it turns out it's toxic. So. <laughs> wow. So how does color work at the bottom of the ocean? I was watching this nature documentary recently, and it, it was specifically focused on different animals, visual systems. And one example was tigers. So it's like they're bright orange amidst maybe like a green jungle. And to us, mm -hmm. it looks completely obvious, but they were showing that most of their prey don't have, uh, I, don't, I don't remember which cone it was, but the one that allows you to see orange. So they just blend it in with the green. So, oh, so it's I like to us, that. they look very conspicuous, but to others, they, they actually have great camo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so in terms of cuttlefish, so cuttlefish themselves, they don't seem to really be able to see color, at least not in the way we do. So they they only, okay, so this is a point of huge debate right now in the cuttlefish community. Like what, what do cuttlefish see? So what we do know is they are sensitive to the polarization of light, which is the sort of the direction that light is bouncing off of any given surface. And most of the time, like most surfaces in nature, um, like the, the light just scatters in a bunch of different directions. Uh, but cuttlefish have structures in their skin that can align all of the, 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 the rays of the photons coming off of them into this nice clean, like all of the vectors are in one direction. Um, and they are sensitive, their, their eyes can sense the, the polarization of light. So there's some speculation that polarization is like a secret communication channel because most of the predators and prey of cuttlefish are not sensitive to polarization and actually they are more sensitive to frequency like we are so you know being able to see how fast the light is bouncing and you know because we have sensitivities to different um like speeds different frequencies that's what com combines and creates the experience of color for us so in the water, you are able to see some amount of, of color, but only in the shallow water, obviously, because once you get very, very deep, um, it's hard for the light to, to, to travel in, in such a way that you, you can't even really see anything at all. Um, so, and, and actually right now, most of our knowledge is based on shallow ocean cephalopods. Um, because deep ocean cephalopods are a very difficult to get to, and most of the ones we we know about so far are very big and scary. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So all of the really cute little ones with the like cool colors and all this, those are all like coral reef, shallow ocean, English Channel, even. Um, so, so yeah. I guess in a shallow ocean you can get very good color perception. And I think it's like what the mantis shrimp has like sensitivity to, it has like 18 yeah. different pigments in its eye. And so, so yeah, I'm sure there's some wild color perception going on uh, with cuttlefish, however. So it seems like they have one pigment in their retina. And there was this one very controversial paper that was published a few years back where the, the authors argued that cuttlefish are able to sort of modulate the sensitivity of that one pigment. And so it's like they could see all colors, but they can only see one color at a time. And this sparked like huge debate. And so I, I honestly, I don't know where that debate has landed at this time. Um, but what is, what is agreed upon is they only have one pigment type in their retina. Their retinas are far more um, structurally uh, like designed to be sensitive to polarization. Um, but actually, in some ways, it's very interesting because at least octopus, we know their their eyeball is like really, really similar to ours. It's this beautiful example of convergent evolution where like, you know, humans on land, octopus is in the ocean. We both decided that a fluid filled spherical like camera lens 
eye that you know focuses light onto the retina in the back like that's the way to go to see we both landed on this um so that that's also very fascinating and i think that that says something about how at least in the shallow water species that that we've studied you know there is enough similarity in the visual needs of ocean creatures and land creatures that you know, there's only so much you can do with the physics of our single universe, right? Like, unless you go to some really wild extremes, like, you're not gonna, th there's gonna be a couple solutions that are really efficient for the physics of our world. So, yeah, I don't actually yeah. know very much about underwater or vision. So <laughs> you, we've reached the, the, the edge of my knowledge here. Yeah, quite a while ago, I, I spoke with an evolutionary biologist who wrote a book called Evolution Gone Wrong. And he talked about you know, all these various adaptations that we have. And one of them, he talked about our eyes. And he basically said that like fish evolved eyes way before we did. And we were, so we were in the ocean a long time ago and our eyes evolved to be in water. And rather mm -hmm. than evolving like dry eyes, we just came up with blinking to keep them wet. So it's like a little hack. Oh, nice, nice. I like that explanation. I also really like, I, I once heard somebody give this anecdote of like, yeah, again, like we all evolved in the ocean. And instead of coming up with like a whole new way of doing things, like especially with childbirth, is like, oh, let's just like carry some water inside of us. Like we know how to be born in in water. So let's just let's just do that again up on the land. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting question. So if we're like 70% water, does that mean that that, that um, animals in the ocean are less because they have it all around them? Oh, wow. I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I really don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're getting, we're getting definitely mostly water. They get very sad if they get out of the water. Oh, yeah. Can they survive at all outside of water? Um like for very short periods of time and it's a very unpleasant experience for them i'm sure so like maybe as long or less than us being in water completely <laughs> right like if we could if we weren't allowed to like come up for air yeah mm -hmm. i don't know a couple minutes yeah. I mean, there are stories about octopuses like octopuses are always the ones that get talked about in in laboratories because they're such escape artists and they're always like cuttlefish are just like look you've given me like a nice place to be like fine i'll be here octopuses are just like what the hell is going on <laughs> and so there's always all these stories about like octopuses getting out of their tanks and getting as far as like the door to the room but then there's like a whole hallway and then like you know like the rest of the building and so then they like they, they if someone doesn't find them beforehand they usually just die mm -hmm. so how social are cuttlefish you have some species like the beta fish who will like eat anyone around them and then you have others who will like die if they don't have a friend oh yeah so uh, cuttlefish are, are sort of so okay the the traditional answer to this is that they are not social creatures um however they they don't they don't like have these like oh they you know they're not like in a pack structure they don't like hunt together they're definitely very um independent let's say uh but i do think that they they do exhibit like i mean they certainly are able to recognize each other and they they spend time usually in like a, a particular territory but that territory is usually in like a coral reef again i'm talking specifically about shallow ocean species because that's what we know about to be fair the okay the one like deep ocean species that gets talked about the most at least in my circles is the humboldt squid i don't know if you've heard about them they're called like the red devils they hunt in packs so that that's a clear example of like a social structure right there um but i don't know if you've heard of like um octopolis or um octlantis okay so no. <laughs> these are both sites in australia and the first one was like uh, oh, there there was like a shipwreck and, and some scuba divers discovered that there was this whole community of octopuses living in there. It was like a little city, like the suburbs kind of, you know, like they, they all had like their little nest and they got into squabbles with their neighbors and like, you know, all this stuff. But people were like, okay, like this isn't really, this can't be taken as an example of octopuses being social or building like, you know, complex structures because it was a shipwreck. It was like a, it, it was a, it was a blip, you know, it was just a, 
a, a human sort of like thing that happened and by sheer coincidence the octopus figured out how to make a community out of it okay fine and then they found a second site where it was purely built from like shells and rocks that the octopuses had brought on site and they had created their own like little like you know like th th their own little like I don't know house with a white picket fence and 2.5 kids and a dog like they like there was this sort of like community going on and so so now this is being questioned um and then anecdotally like when scuba divers um when they encounter cuttlefish um it's like okay yeah sometimes it's like one but usually it's like two or three that show up and they're like really curious to each other and then there's always this question of like okay well maybe maybe some parts of some some members of the group are really shy and so they send out one one guy to go and greet the humans while the rest of them like hang out hidden camouflage so i guess i guess my answer is it's still an open question whether they are social or not we initially thought that no they're not social they're they're you know they're loners but we're gaining little bits and pieces here and there of evidence that seem to suggest maybe it's not so straightforward as they're just loner species yeah so i've learned um Often in nature, when you when you see crazy colors or feathers or something like that, like peacocks are a great example. It has to do with sexual selection. So do we mm. do we know if cuttlefish ever use their their colors for like mating? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for asking this question because <laughs> this is one of my favorite stories about cuttlefish. Okay. So um, cuttlefish mating is uh, so the way that it happens is they they have incredibly short lifespans given like how smart that they can become. So they usually in the wild, they live, you know, between one to two years. It's really not that long at all. And once a female becomes sexually mature, she starts looking for like a, you know, a nice big rock or a, a bit of coral reef, like the underside where there's like a little crevice where she can lay her eggs and then protect the eggs. And the, the, the eggs have like this nice safe space to, to be. Also, when it's not just, you know, natural locations, cuttlefish will lay eggs underneath like lobster and crab traps and on the undersides of boats that have been sitting in a dock for ages and ages and haven't moved. Um, so anyways, once a cuttlefish female starts like going around looking for a place to lay eggs, then, um, you know, the, the sexually mature males are like, oh, here's a female who's ready to mate. I'm going to like follow her around. And so then there starts to be like, you know, they, they put on these, this like zebra stripey, like very flashy, colorful, like pattern that is specific to mating. Um, and, um, and the big guys will like get into wrestling matches and like show off like, oh yeah, I'm so strong. And like, I deserve to have, to, to mate with the female. Hilariously, the smaller males, what they will do is they will camouflage themselves to look like a female. And they'll just like sneak past the big wrestling, the, you know, males and just be like, don't worry about me, boys. I'm just going to go have a quick chat with my girl. And then they will, they will mate with the female. And so here's the thing with cuttlefish. They have eight arms and on the underside of each arm. So in the armpit, they have like a, the, the girls have like a pouch and the <laughs> mating between cuttlefish is this hilariously like Victorian affair because the male will hand over a sperm packet and the female will like take it and place it inside of an armpit pouch and then later she will choose you know okay like this this one was my favorite I'm gonna sprinkle the sperm from this guy over my eggs first and once that runs out I'll move on to my second favorite third favorite and um, there's a there was a cuttlefish researcher in Australia who did a genetic study on these cross-dressing males to see like, OK, like how successful are they when it comes to mating? And what they found was that the cross-dressing males were actually more successful in that first step of actually getting to the female and handing over the sperm packet. And then also in that second choice step of choice, when the female is deciding, all right, which sperm packet do I choose first in order to sprinkle over my eggs? They preferentially choose the cross-dressing males. And to me, this makes perfect sense because how wow. do cuttlefish survive? They 
they have to camouflage. And so I feel like the logic of the females is like, all right, if this guy can convince other males that he's actually a girl and can sneak past them to get to me, then he's probably really good at camouflage. So I want that with for my babies. <laughs> wow. I can't believe the bigger ones haven't figured that out. It seems silly to be fighting and <laughs> wasting all that energy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It, it it's, seems like I'm speaking to a marine biologist more than a neuroscientist, but I say that as a compliment because this is also <laughs> interesting. So, but yeah, let's, let's get, bring it back to, to your neuroscience work. So you mentioned that cuttlefish have like neurons, not just in their head, but all over so that looking at their behavior is kind of like looking at their brain, but how is, when you're, when you're looking at their different, like changing colors, how is that different from a more behavioral study? Like what, what exactly does it teach you about the brain? Mm. Okay, so there's there's a couple of layers here. So um, just a really quick background on like what exactly I mean by their camouflage is controlled by their nervous system. So um, there are tiny structures in the skin that are basically like little rubbery balls full of pigment. And these, these balls are like rolled up really, really tight and they have muscles radiating out to the sides. And each muscle has like three or four uh, axons from neurons in the central part of the nervous system wrapped around that muscle. And there were some really beautiful anatomical studies done like back in the, oh gosh, I'm thinking like 40s and 50s, um, where uh, they, they did electrophysiology and they, they, were, they were looking at like, okay, so in, in humans and you know, in a lot of land creatures, we have discovered that you know, if you electrically stimulate a certain part of the brain, then it moves you know, certain muscles. And this is why we have this idea of the, the homunculus and you know, the, the motor cortex and all, all of those ideas come from these experiments where we electrically stimulated brains and we were like, oh, if I stimulate this part, the hand jerks around. Or if I stimulate this part, they blink frantically. Um, and so they did similar kinds of studies with cuttlefish where they were like, okay, if we stimulate different parts of the central nervous system where we know these axons are coming from, do we get any of the patterns that we see naturally occurring in their behavior? And what we found was that we didn't, you, you can't actually induce purely through electrical stimulation the patterns that we see them put on naturally but you see the like components so you can see like you know if you stimulate one side all of the like dark brown uh pigment sacs open up on the the opposite side of the body and it's very clear like down the middle the the midline one side goes and then you stimulate the other side and the other side goes and then um I, and then you can do different sort of like patterns but none of these are actually patterns as they occur in nature and so these uh these electrophysiology studies were they they're basically now how marine biologists define the um the the observed body pattern by calling them like okay it is a combination of this kind of component and this kind of pattern but it's clear that there's some other sort of like, you know, there, there's some other higher level control and nuance being applied because the purely anatomical connections are, are not, like those aren't the patterns that we see naturally. Um, I'm so sorry, I lost track of the original question. So the question was, and, and I think th this is helping. So how, how we can tell the difference between like just purely observing behavior or what's going on in the body and what's going on in the brain. But you, but you kind of mentioned that already since these, these color pigments are directly controlled by neurons firing. Yeah. And, and also like, I, I would argue, so I think this is something that I think like modern neuroscience, we, we have such a strangely like Cartesian sort of dualistic view of like it's brain versus body. But then if you actually look at the nervous system, like where are your nerves? Like they are all Everywhere. throughout your body, <laughs> right? Like, and, and, and like fundamentally, even if it's doing nothing else, your nervous system is, it is what is allowing you to move. It is what, it, it, it is the thing that creates behavior and the movements of the body. And so even in humans, and yeah, after, after I, 
I was doing all this thinking and studying with cuttlefish and thinking about like, oh, you know, their their body patterns and the, the the expressions on their skin, it can change, you know, based on the situation that they're in, what they what what predator that they believe is nearby, um, you know, what sort of prey they are hunting and it, it, it's all different and modulated based on these contextual clues. And then I started realizing, okay, we talk about how humans can be, you know, red with embarrassment, white with fear, green with envy. And we're not like, you know, like bright green, like the color that you might see, like, I don't know, like on, on some artificially green thing, but we are able to like see some changes to our skin tone that we have observed deeply enough for us to develop these idioms and these sayings where we associate certain colors with certain emotions. And so that to me is another clue that actually we need to not ignore how much of even our nervous system is in the body controlling. I mean, so one could argue that, okay, the, the nervous system, like it, its main function is to move our skeletal structure. That is a big, important function. However, in humans, we have so many nerves that control our facial expression. It doesn't really move any part of our skeleton, but it controls, it, it, it's this concert of, you know, muscle movements that we use in order to express something that's coming from our internal world. And we're trying to bring it outside and make it clear and obvious and observable to somebody else. And this is again, where also theater played a huge role in influencing how I think about this, because, you know, when you're a theater actor, the whole point is, I need to move my body, move my muscles in a certain way to evoke an emotional response. And I don't even have to really be feeling this emotion inside. And that's what let's pretend is. That's what acting is. It's doing something that basically causes like a sensory hallucination in your audience. And that's all done simply through the movement of, you know, externally observable, actions of my nervous system so that when you observe it your nervous system goes oh my god this is what i'm observing let's feel these feelings <laughs> yeah now i really see the connection between observing cuttlefish skin and our skin and, and and faces so that reminds me i've i've heard about some studies showing like when you smile you have different smiles when they're like kind of fake and when you're genuinely happy and that the best actors are the ones who basically think of something that can bring on the genuine emotion rather than trying to fake it. Cause we can tell yes. like by yeah. these tiny differences. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you're not trained, you can totally intuit it. Like just looking at a face, you're like, something's a bit off right there. <laughs> yeah. So you, so you started doing actual studies on humans after the cuttlefish? Um, in a way, yes. So um, after, so I did all my cuttlefish research uh, on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Also, oh, one and more question. I, is the uh, electrical stimulation, is that still considered non-invasive? No, that's definitely invasive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So for a long time, um, because so cuttlefish are technically mollusks and mollusks were considered like not advanced enough to feel pain or to have like, you know, a complex enough internal world for them to be protected by law. Um, this has changed very recently. So now um, cephalopods, so this is cuttlefish, octopus, squid, they are all protected animals. So they uh, require the same level of like ethical approval if you're going to do a study with them that you would need for like a rat or a monkey. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, we, we, we have all come to the agreement that yes, they can probably feel pain. <laughs> right. So the <laughs> electrical me, stimulation. Like, okay, guys, like things can feel pain. Right. Is, let's just admit that. <laughs> so zapping them back in the day allowed us to map out like their own sensory homunculus. But then once we have those mappings, we can sort of intuit it just from uh, visual observation. Well, I think it's the, I, I think, so my, my stance on this is, I think there is still a, a time and a place for invasive studies. But we really like our bar for what constitutes the proper time and place for these invasive studies has dropped like, you know, it's below the floor. Um, and so I, I think the bar needs to be raised a bit. And also 
this is kind of tied into the like you know the the open access movement and this idea that you know if science is for the benefit of the public good science needs to be accessible the results of experiments of studies needs to be accessible it needs to be made understandable to the general public um to experts in other fields etc it can't just be in this like totally jargon like wall um and it can't be behind a paywall either and so my argument is, if we're going to do invasive studies, they need to be thought about carefully, done very well, and then documented very rigorously so that we don't waste, you know, the, the effort and the, the, the life that, and, and it's, there's also an aspect of like the mental health of the researcher doing this invasive work. We need to respect all of that and make sure that none of that goes to waste so that, you know, yes, we can take advantage of that work in future studies such that we can say, okay, this foundation has been laid and now I'm going to build upon that foundation through these non-invasive studies because that foundation is already there. I don't need to repeat that and I don't need, you know, every grad student coming into our program to kill 30 more animals just to prove that they can. We already have that. It's been, you know, peer reviewed. It's solid. We can rely on that. Now, if it ever comes up that, you know, something, uh, you know, creates a paradox that we want to examine more deeply, like that, I think is a just reason for going back and re-examining. There should, al there should always be, a, you know, an opportunity to re-examine what we believe are our foundations and our fundamental assumptions. But I think, once we have them, yeah, I think it's really important to then be a little creative and, and do some stuff that is not just the same old thing over and over again. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry, tangent. Yeah, uh, I, have, I have mixed feelings about that because a lot of this, a, a lot of our knowledge of, of neuroscience and medicine, the foundational knowledge does seem like it came from like these crazy studies doing experiments on like monkeys and and probably experiments that would be very unethical, seen as unethical today. But we learned a lot and maybe it saved lives. So it's like this, this cost benefit thing. Yeah. There's always this argument of like, oh, like if I can save a bunch of human lives, then I'm willing to kill a bunch of rats. And it's like, okay, but like, really, like, are the studies being done today that kill a bunch of rats? Are they actually being done with the very like careful, deliberate mind towards saving humans? Sometimes yes. Sometimes no. And so I, I, I totally agree. There, there's room for invasive work. But I think the, the bar for what counts as, you know, ethical and proper for going forward with these invasive studies, I think that bar needs to come, just be just a little bit higher. Um, oh, but you were originally asking about um, how, d how I moved to, to study humans. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, after I finished, well, so at some point in the middle of my PhD, my advisor moved to London. And so um, I was wrapping up, I had collected all the data from the cuttlefish experiments in Massachusetts. And so we were looking for a way for me to continue doing work with cuttlefish in, in England. And we made a connection with an aquarium uh, in Brighton, which is on the Southern coast of England. And at this aquarium, so they have like an affiliation with a university and um, they also have like sort of a research component at the aquarium. And so we thought, oh, this is really perfect. You know, uh, we made an arrangement where I would, you know, spend like six months volunteering my time learning marine animal husbandry, helping with the, the caring of the animals in the aquarium, learning a bit about like what goes on behind the scenes at the aquarium. And then they would provide like animals and space for me to do more behavioral non-invasive studies. Great, really good plan. Uh, I had a lot of fun, like, you know, learning how to take care of a bunch of different kinds of marine animals and working in an aquarium was like a dream come true. So that was really great. Uh, but then that year, so I, I mentioned earlier how cuttlefish will often lay eggs underneath like lobster and crab traps. And this is really common in the English Channel. And this is actually how most years the, the aquarium would get new cuttlefish. They would get them from fishermen who would pull up their traps and be like, oh my gosh, I have a ton of eggs and I don't want them. So I'll send them to the aquarium and they'll take care of them. Although that particular year, there were no cuttlefish uh, thank you, climate change. Um, there were no cuttlefish eggs. 
And the aquarium really did their best. They like, you know, they got in touch with a with a couple of different fisheries. So cuttlefish are very difficult to breed like in a laboratory or aquarium setting. Um, it, it's still unclear exactly why, but usually like if they're bred, the, the babies are a lot smaller and a lot weaker and they die very easily. Um, but a couple, like there's like two fisheries in the world that have figured it out. And so they got in touch with the, uh, the European one and asked them to send us some 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 eggs and a lot of them hatched in the box on the way and I was like oh my god they just send them in a box like in in the mail that's how they do it this is wild uh so a lot of them hatched on the way and died so anyways I didn't have any animals to work with and the aquarium was like we're really sorry um if there's any other like research you would like to do like in an aquarium setting like we're really open to it and something that uh my advisor and I had been sort of talking about a lot was this idea of yeah of bringing neuroscience out of the lab and into so like into like the wild wild is is like that's asking a lot like we need to take things baby steps at a time so we had been like thinking about okay like museums because I had I talked a lot about my experience working at a museum and how it was this wonderful space for like it was kind of structured but it was also clearly like it, it isn't school and people go there like kind of for fun when they're on holiday with their with their families you know like school trips and it's sort of this like informal more fun space where you're very open to learning but you don't feel like there's like this pressure to learn so it's this nice like middle ground and so we we're like okay like what if we built an exhibit at the aquarium which was uh, which was this like okay we're, we want to do something that connects like the studies that I've been doing with cuttlefish with like what we know about human brains and we talk a lot we in, in this research group we spend a lot of time thinking about like, you know, what is intelligence and what does cortex do? Like, what is it for and why is it so big in humans? Like, this is still a very, very much an open question. So we were like, well, let's pose that question to the aquarium visitors and see what they can come up with. Also, let's do some benchmarking of like, you know, what can we observe easily in the field in humans? And the thing that we landed on was eyes, because your eyes are like, you know, they are anatomically speaking, they are basically your central nervous system. So I like to describe them as like, they're bits of your brain that got shoved out of your skull because your brain also wanted to have like a direct, <laughs> direct contact with the world. Um, and, you know, again, I, I love referring back to old sayings because there's always this like beautiful, delightful kernel of philosophical truth, poetic truth in them. When people say that eyes are a window to the soul, well, okay, let's, let's test that idea. How much can we learn? And here's the thing, psychology and psychophysics in laboratories have been studying this for a really long time. Pupil dilation, eye tracking, this is a well-established metric of human behavior and human psychology. And so then the argument we made was, okay, a lot of these studies were done, uh, you know, in, in a lab with, you know, 10 to 20 um, middle-class white American college male students. So that's like a tiny, tiny slice of humanity. But this aquarium gets, you know, school visits from all over Europe, from as far as China. We get, you know, small babies and grandparents, huge age range, huge socioeconomic range. So let's create an experiment where, and so what we ended up doing was we created an exhibit where there's like a viewport and you're invited to, to watch some videos of animals doing interesting, surprising things. And while you watch, we're gonna video record your eyes up close and then we'll replay the recording for you so you can see what your eyes do. Because we spend all day looking at the world with our eyes, but it's not so often we get to see what our own eyes are doing when they are working for us. And so it was incredibly popular and we managed to, um, we managed to get over 24,000 participants over the course of 13 months. Um, yeah, big shout out to yeah, my collaborators wow. <laughs> who helped build this incredibly robust exhibit uh, that, that was able to collect so much data. And so then we were basically, it was just like a huge validation study of like, okay, if we get enough people 
involved? Can we overcome the noise? Everyone always talks about how like, oh, as soon as, why do we do things in the lab? Well, because everything in the world is messy and it's noisy and it's just, you know, it's, it's impossible to get precise data out of it. And we were like, all right, we see that we're going to raise you 24,000 participants. And actually at that scale, actually, I think the, uh, when I did the benchmarking, it was like after about 4,000, we had we had like the the accuracy plateaued so we had 24,000 we could have gotten the same results with you know uh what is that an eighth of our study population um but still there's that middle ground between 24,000 and 20. so um we found the 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 sweet spot which is a couple thousand participants so if you can if you can design a study that is non-invasive, engaging enough, and can you you can entice at least a couple thousand people to to participate. Then you'll probably have enough participants, enough n. Your n will be large enough to overcome the noisiness of the world. Is the argument that I made with this study? Yeah. Wow. So what what were you looking at? What were you showing them? And what did you find from the from the different eyes eye movements? Yeah. So. Um, the, so the, the sequence was, um, there was a calibration sequence where you looked at like little pulsing balls of light in all four corners and then, then in the middle. So that was just for us to get like, a, okay, when the eye moves, this is where the screen is. Um, and then the first like 15 seconds, we had like six possible videos you could watch, uh, which was like a, a cat, you know, jumping onto a bed to pounce on a toy. Um, a bird coming and picking like a breadcrumb out of somebody's fingers. Uh, we had like a, a very like artistic video of like a cuttlefish sort of like pulsing and camouflaging on top of like um, this piece of art. Uh, and then we had a video from my previous studies of a cuttlefish hunting a bit of shrimp on a like a robotic arm. And then we had again another like really artsy one where it was like the, the the image was sort of like mirrored down the middle, but you couldn't quite tell until like there were some fish that like swam towards the middle and then they just like disappeared uh, because of like video post-production tricks. Um, and these are all videos that I asked the cephalopod research community and also my like immediate community of friends for like, hey, do you have any videos of like interesting weird things that like animals do like this is like youtube you know style like wow check out what this animal did this is so weird and so along those lines then after that first chunk you know so there was like a random you know people would see one of these six it was just to like mix it up a bit so that you know if a group comes to the aquarium and you know one person does the exhibit they're like oh yeah i saw this and the next person won't be like, oh yeah, it was exactly the same. They'll be like, no, no, it was totally different. And so then it'll get more people to, to watch it. But the last part portion of it was the same for everyone. And this is a video from uh, my collaborator, Roger Hanlon, where he was scuba diving once. And this is, this is rather famous if you've ever gone to any like, I don't know, cephalopod research talk or looked up videos of it online, where um, he's like swimming close to what looks like just a rock and some ferns. And then suddenly it de-camouflages into an octopus. Because the octopus was like, I'm hiding, I'm hiding, I'm hiding. Holy shit, this human is gotten too close i'm gonna get as big and as scary as possible then it inks at the camera and swims away and so this is this was a video that you know roger from his own experience of showing it to people and also like it, it's on youtube and it has a lot of views and every all the comments are like wow that was so surprising i did not expect to see that octopus there so we were like okay this is a bona fide like surprising video and what we would expect, the literature says, that when we see something surprising, your pupil dilates and you fixate on the thing that you think is surprising. And so what we were looking for was, okay, you know, people of different ages, different interests, different backgrounds, they'll be looking at all sorts of things, but does everybody stop and look? Like, do all the eye movements stop and fixate in that moment? And do, does the pupil size grow you know, consistently across all of our population. And that's exactly what we found. Actually, wrangling this data set was such a pain in the neck. And it was just like, this was literally the last figure that I was putting together for to, before I submitted my thesis. And I was just like, 
I was talking to my advisor whose name is also Adam. I was like, Adam, I can't get this figure. Like, this is the best I can do. And he's like, no, no, I know. I know that we can make it. it I know it must look better than this. It's got to be more convincing. And finally, I like found this one bug and I was like, oh my God, I think I found it. And I reran the code, which like, on my little laptop, it takes like seven or eight hours to run on my partner's gaming computer where we utilize like all 24 cores <laughs> and it sounds like the computer's taking off. Um, it took a couple minutes and we got the plot where it was like with like because our, you know, our 95 percent confidence interval was so tight because we had so many our, our N was so huge. It was just like this beautiful like right on the frame where I was like, I'm pretty sure this is when the octopus is fully de camouflaged. And this is me going through like frame by frame being like, I don't know if this is going to match the experience of someone just watching it in an aquarium where they're distracted by their friends or their small child or their parent telling them, come on, hurry up. We got to go get lunch. But I was like, I'm pretty sure this is about when most people should notice. And literally right then, like the pupil size just balloons. And then like, the the saccadic movement the way that we were measuring movement it like you know it's like movement 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 no movement <laughs> it was so satisfying so yeah we were able to valid basically it was a huge validation study of a lot of the psychophysics work that has been done in the labs and we were able to say yes actually um we can we can replicate that and we can validate that on a much larger and far more diverse population so that was that was really satisfying to be able to do yeah that's so cool so what are you working on now post phd um uh, okay so i am working at a tiny little company called neuro gears it was started by another uh former student of my advisor and actually my advisor also left academia started his own company and we are all in like a shared office space together so it's almost like i did not leave <laughs> my research group. But um, so I've always been very, very passionate about education, um, especially because, uh, especially science education. And, um, and so every summer, like, since I was an undergrad, I, I had been teaching at this summer camp. And I feel like a lot of my drive towards understanding like, healthy, happy brains in the wild comes from teaching at the summer camp and realizing like, oh my God, our school systems are really doing us such a huge disfavor. The way that it's structured, the incentive systems that we have set up, the pressures that we place on young people growing up and what we lead them to believe is important. This is developing their brains in all of the wrong ways. Um, and so, uh, so the company Neurogears is there's an aspect of it which is focused on building better tools for neuroscientists, uh, building them open source. Um, and so uh, the, the software that sort of is like the beating heart of the company is called Bonsai RX. Uh, RX stands for reactive. And basically it's a visual programming language for creating uh, interactive systems. And um, so Gonzalo, the company director, he was working on this software from before he started his PhD, but really refined it during his PhD. And um, this was this is basically what all of our neuroscience experiments ran on. And basically, it's just to make it really, really easy to be like, I need a, a webcam to connect to 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 you know, and and I when a certain thing happens in this region of interest I need a light to go on and this door to open you know just like being able to connect a bunch of components very very easily so this uh this software is a big part of what we do we provide sort of like technical support and training and also um, sort of like building up an open source community around those using it because we want to keep it free for the end users. And so the development of it is being funded through um, collaborations with research institutes and universities who basically pay the company to come and train their IT, to come set up experiments, to come troubleshoot stuff. So that's sort of the 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 sort of more cut and dry like tech side of things but then that is enabling us to have collaborations with artists uh, because the same software Gonzalo worked really really hard to make it very very general purpose so that it could be used not only for neuroscience experiments but also for interactive exhibits for you know um interactive performance for um performance where say you want 
you know, the heartbeat of the dancer to modulate the, the music that is being played that they are dancing to. So, you know, this, again, interactive systems, all of that. And, and actually the exhibit that we did at the aquarium, that was like one of the first gigs of the company because Gonzalo graduated a few years before me. And he was at this juncture where he was like, should I do a postdoc? Should I start this company? And um, we were all like, no, 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 don't do a postdoc, start the company. And then we can join the company. <laughs> and so that was the first like contract of the company. Um, and so then, so then now we're also creating, um, so we started out creating like neuroscience, like workshops and like intensive courses for PhD students, but also for like high school students, teaching them, you know, these are the tools to be able to do field neuroscience. And this is the theory underlying field neuroscience. Um, and so I do a lot of teaching. I do a lot of work with artists. I do a lot of like outreach. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a total mixed bag. Um, I, and, and, Gonzalo has been encouraging me to use my company time to also like do more graphic novels because that also is sort of in line with our our big dream like the the moonshot goal is to build a school um and this is a very deliberately vague goal which is to kind of take into account like Yes, education is a sort of, it, it's a scientific endeavor, but it's also a social endeavor and also a highly political endeavor. There's a lot of people who are highly invested in the system that exists now. Um, we, we're not really in a position to take on all of those like political battles. And so the idea is, well, there's this interesting sort of interstitial space that is currently somewhat unclaimed. So this is the space of like after school programs, of summer programs, um, where we can kind of teach the way we want to and we're not beholden to like, well, this is the state requirements for what students need to, like what kind of tests students need to pass at the end of the year. Like fundamentally, like I'm definitely opposed to this idea that you know, the way that we judge how well you've learned, how well a teacher has taught, how well a school is creating safe spaces for kids to grow up is through standardized testing. I think that's, that's really kind of, that's really kind of backwards and it, it feels still stuck in like industrial revolution era thinking. And I would like to figure out a way to sort of help us move forward so that we're not still stuck in that thinking. I mean, everybody talks about like, oh, we need more interdisciplinary, we need STEM, we need STEAM. And it's like, okay, but you can't just shoehorn that into the old system. We actually, we, we're gonna have to actually at some point let go of the old system and just everybody agrees. Like it's, it's really not working, but it's so scary to, to say, okay, it's not working. We abandon it for something new. And whenever, whenever I've been faced with a situation of, okay, I would like to come up with a new education system, the criticism that always comes up is, how will you prove that it works? And I'm like, do, we, do I really need proof when there is so much proof that the current education system is not working? So, you know, tell me who needs to prove what here. Yeah, the, so, anyway, the irony I there, I guess, is that off. any proof would have to sort of be standardized. So you'd be creating a new standardized test to, exactly. to, to measure how standardized tests weren't working. Yeah, exactly. That's a kind yeah. of a paradox. But I think you're the first... Um, you're the first scientist I'm speaking to who's not working in a university setting. So it's really cool to hear about the additional opportunities for science communication and education in the private sector. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I think in a way, because of the way we're doing this, we're not. We're, so at first I, I was calling Neurogears a startup because we're so small and we are like mm -hmm. a tiny new company. But uh, Gonzalo was like, yeah, I don't know. I don't really want to call us a startup because a startup sort of invokes this idea that we want to like you know, push out a product and get bought as soon as possible by some bigger company. And that is not at all our goal. Our goal is to like work on these, you know, interesting intersectional like projects that we believe are important for society. I mean, this, this makes us sound so like, you know, we, we think we're so self-important, but it's like, we, we want to be in a space where we can genuinely think about like, what do we feel are important projects 
that don't necessarily make a ton of money, but we think are really important for society. This is nominally what academia is supposed to be, but academia has also gone off on its own like weird little derail. Um, and, and a lot of academic settings now are being treated more like, you know, business settings than, than settings of like risk taking, you know, experimental learning. And so we're trying to figure out how can we reclaim this space of creative risk taking experimental learning where you're not under pressure to make a lot of money. You're not under pressure to publish or perish. You're not under, you know, all these other weird metrics and the goal is simply to to live live a good life and to make a good life for the people around you and how how do we do that in a way that really honors you know what we've got in here this beautiful thing that has evolved over millions of years it is an incredible engine for imagination and creation and right now most of the you know most of the ways that we use it demand only for its ability to consume. And we want to figure out how can we make more demands for creation instead of just consuming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great place to close. And I, I really look forward to, to hearing what's to come from that. Cool, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, Tanbe, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure, definitely.